After World War II, a special American group called Alsos Mission went with Allied troops to Germany. They were looking for a hidden place where Germany might have made a dangerous nuclear bomb. The leader was an American scientist named Samuel Gauchmidt. They followed the clues and arrived at a pretty village called Heigerloch in southern Germany. The village had a church on a high cliff. Underneath it, the soldiers discovered Germany's secret laboratory. So what they found was just a small cave, like a wine cellar, with a failed attempt at a nuclear reactor that nobody could make work. Even if it worked, it couldn't be used to build a bomb. Germany was very good at science, and Werner Heisenberg was a brilliant physicist of his time. He knew a lot about atoms, more than anyone else. If anyone could have made a bomb, it would have been him. He'd already done some groundbreaking work in science. In 1925, he had to go to a deserted island called Heligoland because he was sick with hay fever to recover. When Heisenberg was young, he was very confident and didn't follow the old rules of physics. Instead, he created a whole new way of thinking called quantum mechanics when he was just 24 years old. It was a big change in the history of science. But because he was a complex person, some people weren't sure if he'd fit in with the new leaders in Germany. He was born in 1901 in Bavaria and came from a wealthy family. He didn't like to be second best in anything. Heisenberg and his brother were very competitive, and he couldn't stand the idea of being wrong. He was inspired by a romantic dream of Germany that included Bavaria and Beethoven. This dream led him to join a youth movement which was revolutionary. They didn't wear normal clothes, but instead they wore leather shorts, which was not considered popular at that time. They did fun things like swimming without clothes and singing around campfires. It wasn't respectable for the middle class, but it meant a lot to him because it was romantic and special. Heisenberg's professors at university quickly realized he was incredibly talented. Everyone knew he would become a big name in the new physics. In the 1920s, physics had a wonderful time. It was like a golden age. Scientists from all over the world worked together like a big family. They traveled to each other's homes and universities all across Europe. They wrote letters to each other, worked together, and sometimes had debates. It was a very open and friendly time for physics. In Copenhagen, young physicists gathered every year, and Niels Bohr was like their respected father in the world of physics. Heisenberg was considered the important successor to Bohr. He spent two years working with Bohr in Copenhagen, like a close helper and almost a son. In the past, Germany was the important place for culture and science, and many ambitious students wished to go there. German was the language used in science all over the world, and Heisenberg represented the values of this civilized and intelligent Germany before the Nazis came. He was a role model of a good German, embracing qualities like living modestly, being reliable, and always on time. He believed in carrying forward culture. Heisenberg loved culture and science, but he didn't like politics at all. Heisenberg didn't like politics and wanted to stay away from its problems and unfairness. That's why he chose physics and science as his path. He hoped he could do research without getting involved in lies or tricky diplomatic matters. In 1928, he came back to Germany from Copenhagen and became its youngest professor. But at that time, Germany and the universities were going through difficult times. In the late 1920s, the Nazis were becoming stronger, and there were protests and violence like in other places. Some students joined the Nazi party. The professors had different opinions, and some of them supported the Nazis. In 1933, Hitler became the leader, and he wanted his rule to last for a long time. At the same time, Heisenberg was going to Stockholm to receive the Nobel Prize in physics. He didn't know that Hitler would soon control German science for his own purposes. The Nazis burned books in front of the university library in Berlin in 1933, including Albert Einstein's book because he was Jewish. This event marked the start of Germany's scientific isolation. In 1933, Hans Bethe, who was also Jewish, was teaching at the University of Tübingen. He wanted to talk about an important discovery by James Chadwick, an English scientist, in his lectures. But some students with Nazi emblems caused trouble in his classes. Chadwick had discovered something very important called the neutron, and he wanted to give lectures about it in the physics department. 
However, Hans was told to cancel these lectures because the students would create problems. It was a sad time because the most scientifically advanced nation was now under the control of a group of thugs. One of the first Nazi laws was about restoring the professional civil service. In 1933, the government fired all civil servants with Jewish relatives, including teachers, doctors, and university professors. In a photograph taken in 1930, Heisenberg was with talented colleagues. Four of them, who were Jewish, had to leave Germany. Even though Heisenberg was not Jewish, he faced suspicion because he was a physicist, and people associated physics with Einstein, who was Jewish. It's a tough time for Heisenberg. He was the youngest professor in Leipzig. Heisenberg greatly admired Einstein and often spoke about him in his work and his classes, which resulted to fewer people attending his lectures. The SS Weekly, the Black Corps, attacked him as a white Jew. They even falsely accused him of being gay. So Himmler had to intervene. He ordered Heisenberg to the headquarters and made Heisenberg wait for hours, hoping to intimidate him. Heisenberg could hear others screaming and shouting in pain while he waited. He left without meeting Himmler and was very terrified and shaken when he got home. Later, after a year using his family's connection to the Himmlers, Heisenberg got a letter from Himmler promising no more attacks, but warning him to be careful about what he'll be teaching. Heisenberg, therefore, became extra cautious whenever he had to take up a Jewish name. He would actually sweat about it in class. In 1938, another scientist named Otto Hahn discovered something incredible. He broke apart atoms of uranium, releasing a massive amount of energy. People realized this could lead to a super powerful weapon. This discovery became the main topic at a physics conference in the USA in 1939. During the conference, they urged him to stay in America, realizing that returning to Germany might mean being forced to build an atom bomb for Hitler. They discussed physics at first, but as the afternoon wore on, the conversation shifted towards politics. The physicist questioned whether he truly wanted to go back to Germany or if it would be wiser to stay in America. Heisenberg pondered the idea but ultimately expressed his strong attachment to Germany. He identified himself as a German and believed he belonged there, despite the looming war's destructive potential. He was determined to be in his homeland to lend a helping hand, regardless of what lay ahead. In September 1939, Heisenberg was made the chief scientist for the Nazi bomb project. He embraced the responsibility wholeheartedly, and everyone respected his authority in the project. It was a significant honor for him to be chosen. As he had faced scrutiny in the past, this appointment showed that he was now being trusted and welcomed back into favor. Heisenberg and other scientists discovered something important about building a bomb. They learned that a uranium atom behaves like a mousetrap ready to spring. When a tiny particle called a neutron, shown as a cork, hits the uranium atom, it splits apart with great force. This splitting releases two more neutrons, and those two can hit two other atoms, creating four neutrons. Then those four can hit four more atoms, releasing eight neutrons, and so on. This process happens extremely quickly, almost instantly, like a chain reaction. To make it work, they used a clever trick, which is like a plastic cover in their experiment. This trick was essential to get the chain reaction started and controlled. In simple terms, without the plastic cover, the chain reaction wouldn't start, and the corks, or neutrons, would just fly away. They needed this cover to control the process, just like they would need many mousetraps to trigger the reaction without it. Similarly, with uranium, they required a large amount of it, a critical mass, to make the chain reaction work. But nobody knew exactly how much was needed. However, in 1940, Heisenberg had the answers and was building a reactor for this purpose. The plan was to make the reactor unstable and explode. Heisenberg was urgent in his efforts, but the Western nations were not acting as quickly. Albert Einstein tried to warn the American president about how close Germany was to making an atomic bomb. The Americans didn't show much interest because they knew that an atom bomb would require a very rare type of uranium called U-235. However, less than 1% of the uranium found in nature is U-235. Until then, no one had succeeded in separating even a tiny amount of it. Since a large amount of U-235, in the order of tons, 
was needed for the critical mass, building an atom bomb seemed like a fantasy. But then something surprising happened. Rudolf Piles, one of Heisenberg's Jewish students who had to leave Germany because of the Nazis, went to England and met another Jewish emigrant named Otto Frisch. They both received temporary jobs at Birmingham University. Even though Piles couldn't work on sensitive projects, they explored the idea of the atom bomb. In 1940, they discovered that the critical mass needed for the bomb was much smaller, only a kilogram, much less than previously thought. This opened up the possibility of building a bomb. However, they realized that Heisenberg, their teacher, must have made the same calculation. In 1941, Heisenberg was building a reactor for a uranium chain reaction, and he faced an extraordinary decision. The road to a bomb lay open before him, he said, and he was so alarmed by this prospect that he sought the advice of his colleague, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. They decided to visit their old teacher, Niels Bohr, who had great influence among scientists worldwide. They wanted to talk to him about the possibility of physicists coming together to agree not to build the bomb during the war, or at least not rush into it. Heisenberg had this idea during an evening walk with Bohr in a park in Copenhagen in 1941, and it became one of the most famous conversations in science history. Heisenberg was afraid of building a destructive bomb and wanted to prevent this discovery from causing harm. He thought if he could convince Bohr, they could form a league of anti-bomb physicists worldwide to prevent its development. However, according to a secret letter from Bohr, he agreed with Heisenberg's later interpretation of the meeting. Heisenberg attempted to convince Bohr to accept the German control of Denmark and cooperate with the German embassy, but Bohr strongly rejected this idea. Heisenberg also tried to persuade Bohr to be on good terms with the Germans. This situation raises questions about Heisenberg's motives. Was he genuinely trying to prevent a potential nuclear disaster under Nazi rule? Or was he secretly working with the Nazis, putting pressure on his old friend Bohr? So the question remains. Was Heisenberg a good German trying to prevent a Nazi nuclear disaster, or was he actually working for the Nazis and putting pressure on his old friend? In late 1941, Werner Heisenberg delivered a lecture to top Nazi officials about the possibility of a bomb. He also submitted a detailed report describing a potential exploding reactor bomb using enriched uranium-235 and a moderator like graphite. It appeared that Heisenberg was making progress, not sabotaging the project. Meanwhile, the Americans, spurred by the discovery that a small amount of U-35 could build a bomb, assembled a team of scientists for a historic industrial project. Ironically, the leaders were Jewish physicists who had been forced to leave Germany by the Nazis. As Nazi Germany reached its peak, they believed the war would soon end, and all they needed was a decisive weapon. Albert Speer, the newly appointed armaments minister, examined various secret weapons projects, including the one pursued by Germany's physicists to create a city-destroying weapon. Speer visited Heisenberg at the nuclear research facility known as the Virus House in a Berlin suburb. It was a critical moment for Heisenberg to secure funding for his bomb project. Surprisingly, Heisenberg only asked for enough money to build a small underground laboratory even though Speer was willing to provide much more. The Americans were spending billions on their project, while Heisenberg asked for just a few hundred thousand Reichmarks. During dinner that night, Speer asked Heisenberg how much money he wanted, and Heisenberg's modest request made Speer believe that he didn't really need much more. As a result, the German atomic bomb project came to an end. Heisenberg's bomb idea didn't gain much momentum. After the war ended in 1945, the Allies were concerned about the possibility of a Nazi bomb. They wanted to know if Heisenberg had indeed been working on a bomb or if he had attempted to sabotage it. To find out the truth, they gathered the top German scientists, including Heisenberg, at Farm Hall, a country house in England. Unbeknownst to the scientists, their conversations were secretly recorded by hidden microphones. In the transcripts, we get a detailed account of their discussions, minute by minute, about the technical possibilities of building a bomb. They traced their decisions from 1939 onwards, explaining what they understood, what they didn't, and how they saw their project during the war compared to the Allies' efforts. The most revealing part of the farm hall transcription came on August 6, 1945, 
when a British officer informed Otto Hahn about the announcement of the atomic bomb success. President Truman, on the radio, had revealed that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. How did Heisenberg react? Heisenberg's initial reaction, as seen in the transcripts, is quite shocking. He finds it impossible to believe the news about the atomic bomb success. He thinks it might be a mistake and that some inexperienced person in America must have bluffed them by claiming the bomb's equivalent to 20,000 tons of high explosive. Heisenberg dismisses the idea, calling the Americans second raiders and insists that the bomb cannot work at all. He remains skeptical and rants on for several minutes, refusing to believe that such a feat is possible. Heisenberg's behavior shows that he doesn't seem to know how to build the bomb or even consider it possible. The scientists' discussions cover a wide range of ideas, from practical to completely impractical, involving reactors, bombs with moderators, and various exotic designs using different materials, like protoactinium, ionium, and thorium. They try to understand how the Allies could have achieved what they had believed to be unrealistic. On the night of the Hiroshima bombing, Otto Hahn confronts Heisenberg, asking him to explain how an atomic bomb works. At this point, the image of Heisenberg as a noble scientist denying Hitler the bomb crumbles. It becomes evident that he doesn't actually know how to build one. The whole story hinges on the calculation of critical mass, the amount of U-235 needed to start a chain reaction. Heisenberg believed that every neutron had to split an atom, and he calculated that a critical mass of 13 tons of uranium was required for an explosion. However, his concept was fundamentally wrong. It turned out that not every neutron needed to hit an atom for the chain reaction to continue. Many neutrons could miss their mark, and the chain reaction would still progress. Heisenberg's mistake had significant consequences. This miscalculation cost Germany the war, as they failed to develop the atomic bomb. This amount of uranium, about one kilogram, was estimated by Frisch and Piles in March 1940 as the necessary quantity for an atomic bomb. They believed that with a considerable industrial investment, this amount could be isolated in about a year, making the bomb a feasible possibility rather than just a theoretical idea. Heisenberg, on the other hand, had calculated 13,000 kilograms of uranium-235 would be needed for a bomb, an amount that would be possible in about 150 years. The mistake in Heisenberg's calculations made it physically impossible for Germany to convincingly show progress in developing an atomic bomb. While some young scientists might have known this, they didn't dare contradict Heisenberg, who was a respected and eminent professor. Heisenberg had a jovial and friendly personality, but he had a temper, and challenging him came with risks. You beat him at table tennis and he comes out at you. At Farmhall, the German physicist realized that Heisenberg had made a serious mistake. Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker tried to save face by suggesting that they didn't build the bomb because the scientists didn't want to on moral grounds. This idea of the moral resistance of the German physicists became a story debated for years, with some portraying Heisenberg as psychologically preventing himself from making the calculation to sabotage the project, which was seen as un-German. After six months at Farmhall, Heisenberg and the others returned to Germany. Heisenberg couldn't accept that he had simply made an error in his calculations. He never claimed to be a hero or have moral courage. He was self-critical and believed he was fortunate not to have faced a life-or-death situation that would test his heroism. The betrayal in the end was not about working on an atomic bomb for Hitler, but whether one should only focus on physics or also be a moral human being. Heisenberg should have chosen to be both. We might wish to believe that great scientists are morally superior, but in Heisenberg's case, it was his flawed calculations, not his moral courage, that spared us from a Nazi bomb. <laughs>